fortunate to have in studio uh, today the two main uh, folks running for the second congressional district seat currently held by Alex Mooney. He will not be returning to that seat. And the two are uh, sitting uh, to my left. And uh, the first one we'll introduce is the Republican nominee. He is the current state treasurer, former member of the House of Delegates, Riley Moore. Riley, good morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Steve Wendelin is here as well. Steve, uh, bend that microphone a bit more toward you there. If you don't you know, hit that, the little frame around it, just uh, take it and move it. There you go. There you go. Just like there, there you go. go. Just All like right. That. There we go. And uh, Steve, good morning, and thanks for coming back again as the Democrat nominee. Yep. And obviously, I'm not qualified to be a sound engineer, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I better win this. It's my job. I failed you terribly. <laughs> Uh, what we'll do is, and we're, this will be kind of formal slash informal as we do this throughout the course of the hour. Uh, we'll have you both open up with a, a statement and then close with a statement. In between, we're just going to talk to you just like it's a regular interview here on the program. Great. Okay, we appreciate, again, the two of you making this appearance here. And uh, Riley, as the incumbent, I'll have you go first if you want to in reintroduce yourself to the folks around the area and uh, tell them why you're running for the second congressional district seat and why they should vote for you. Sure. Thanks, Rob. Riley Moore, currently the West Virginia State Treasurer. I was formerly in the House of Delegates, in-house leadership representing Jefferson County, which is where I am residing, where I am from. Originally born in Morgantown, West Virginia. I live in Jefferson County with my three kids and my wife. And uh, the reason I am running, I want to continue a lot of the success and hard work that we have done here in the state treasurer's uh, office and also in the House of Delegates. And for example, would be the push that I've led in this country against ESG, being the first elected official in the United States to divest our tax dollars from BlackRock, for instance, over their boycott of the fossil fuel industry. So if I'm elected to Congress, I want to continue to fight against ESG. I want to continue to stand up for our fossil fuel industries here in West Virginia, coal, gas, and oil, all three. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are for the uh, all the above energy. I'm all the below uh, the ground, that is. Uh, I think that's the energy that certainly makes the most sense uh, in the country. And I'd like to see the United States not only energy independent, but I want to see us as an energy superpower, net exporter of energy. So we can, rather than uh, using uh, the United States military and our men and women uh, in uniform to constantly protect our interests and equities abroad, be able to leverage things like trade and energy so we can protect ourselves by leveraging these God-given natural resources and advantages that we have here in the United States. Uh, I also am running because I would like to see the United States border completely closed. I want to build the wall. I want to protect the border and stop the flow of illegal immigration into the United States, um, which is something that I certainly share with President Trump and many of the other Republican candidates run up and down the ballot. I'm proud to say I'm endorsed by President Trump in this election and gave me a very, as he put it, beautiful endorsement. And uh, also endorsed by the vice presidential candidate, J.D. Vance, as well. So last thing I'd mention that I'd like to see is a rebalance and reshaping of our relationship uh, as it relates to China. Uh, President Trump and myself has, have been calling for tariffs on uh, specific items uh, across the board, and especially steel, uh, which is so important to the 2nd Congressional District. Cleveland Cliffs up there in Weirton, we saw what happened with them, and we were able to recapitalize that endeavor up there at Cleveland Cliffs, which I was part of the negotiating team that went to Cleveland Cliffs to put the $50 million in to save that steel manufacturing facility. So that's what I'd like to see is continued economic growth in West Virginia, across this country uh, as well, lowering inflation, stop the flow of illegal immigration, stand up for educational choice and freedom, and rebalance the relationship that we have with China, and also always standing firm and true to the principles that first got me elected and representing every mountaineer throughout the congressional district in a way that I think that they would find favorable and represent their values as well in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Riley Moore, now uh, Democrat Steve Wendelin. Steve? Hi, my name is uh, Stephen Wendelin. I recently retired a little over a year ago as a commander from the United States Navy after 39 years of service. 
10 years of that was as a reservist, but the other 29 years were active duty. That includes 22 months boots on ground between Iraq and Afghanistan. I am, you know, for 39 years, the Navy told me where I had to live. And the first opportunity I got to choose, I chose West Virginia because it is such an amazing place. I've been all over the world. I've lived all over the world. And I chose to live in the most beautiful place in the world with amazing people. So that's what brings me here. I'm running for the simple fact of this. Over the last nine years, the rhetoric has torn our country in half. It is, and it is not sustainable. We have Americans screaming and accusing each other of horrible things. We've stopped listening to each other. And it's time that we start bringing some civility back to our national government, which has now bled into the state and the local levels. Uh, we are so much more than Democrat and Republican or conservative or, uh, or liberal. Um, we are all Americans. And when you hear things like the former president, you know, refer to our country as a garbage can, that tells you how far we've gone. If a candidate would have said that nine years ago, they would have been ridden out of town on a rail. And now it's almost normal. Well, that can stop. I initially decided to kind of was interested in running because uh, who the gentleman who is currently in the seat, who's vacated the seat, um, Mr. Alex Mooney, the one thing I heard from pretty much everyone, Republican and Democrat, is he's just never present. He doesn't respond to his constituents. And basically it's like, well, we can do a little bit better than that. The real thing that tipped me over the edge where I said, no, I need to do this, was January 6th. This is not who we are as a country. Uh, we do not change power through mobs and mob violence. It's just not who we are. And so, um, yes, I am a Democrat. I am the Democrat nominee. But I consider myself a rabid moderate. Um, I feel that 80% of us can agree upon 80% of the issues, and the other 20% of those issues, that same 80% can find workable solutions. It's the 10% on either side that's tearing our country apart. We need to take the megaphones away from them and put them in the car seat and get on with driving our country and doing the business of America. Thank you, Steve. Now, uh, just so you know, guidelines going forward, uh, if your opponent mentions your name, brings up one of your policies or such, you have the right to a direct response at the conclusion of their point. And uh, otherwise, again, we'll just have kind of an informal flow to this. Bill, why don't you go ahead and uh, take the next question here? Both of you alluded, uh, more so you, Steve, about the uh, rhetoric that we're seeing in, in Washington just now. Uh, and it's become very polarized. In my history, my experience, it's, it it's at the highest level it's ever been. If elected, what would you do or what could you do to reduce the, the height of this very, I call it, very corrosive rhetoric that we're seeing now? Well, first off, you know, stop looking at people as Democrats or Republicans, them and us. I'm just so tired of hearing that. Part of this got started actually way back when with uh, uh, Newt Gingrich with shortening the, the work week of Congress. Um, they don't socialize together. They don't go out in the evenings with each other. Essentially, we have the legislators in D.C. for just a little over 48 hours a week. And because of that, they're constantly working. They never socialize with each other. And so there aren't any cross aisle friendships that there used to be in the past. So we need to maybe look at that and establishing that. Also under Newt Gingrich, and oh, by the way, it was carried on with, with Nancy Pelosi, is there's too much power it's kind of given to the Speaker of the House. That House belongs to the people and to all the constituency. And so we need to start looking back to how we used to do this and how we used to get work done. Because right now, nothing's getting done. It's all political theater at this point. I'm going to ask the same question to Ryland in just a second. But would you work across the aisle? Are there issues that, that you see that you could work across the aisle to reach a compromise? Absolutely. Can you name some? Well, for one, immigration bill, which, again, 
doesn't necessarily directly affect West Virginia. We have a shrinking population. We're 98% white. Um, but the immigration bill needs to be passed. There was a bipartisan bill, and it got tanked. So things like that. As far as balancing a budget, that should be nonpartisan. We have not passed a budget on time since 1997. That's Congress's one job is to fiscally run the country, and we don't do it. So, yeah, that needs to be bipartisan. And so we need to look at the policies that have led to this and start undoing those policies and getting back down to basics. Rather, the same questions to you. One, how would you personally uh, reduce some of this high tension that we have in D.C., reduce the, the corrosive rhetoric? And second, are there certain items that you'd be willing to work across the aisle on? I think first we need to establish whether or not Riley agrees with you that there is corrosive rhetoric in exactly Washington, right. D.C. Exactly yes. yeah. right, yes. That's right, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't really know about the corrosive rhetoric. What I know is about the weaponization of government that's been going on, particularly as it relates to President Donald Trump. I'll flash back to when he first got into office in 2017. This entirely, which turned out to be completely fake, Russia hoax that he had somehow colluded with the Russians to win the election. Turns out none of that was true. It's all made up. The Justice Department and the FBI have been coming after Trump for the last eight years, at least, since he has stepped into public office. Now, if he wins, which I believe he is going to win, and let's say somehow the Democrats take the House, which I don't think they will, but if they did, they're going to impeach him on day one. They're going to impeach him on day one. So they're the ones that have been weaponizing the government against their political opponents. And I think on our side of the aisle, all we can do is fight. And that's what we're trying to do. And we're trying to fight for our ability to be able to represent people in office and our constituencies. And look, you know, I'm going to stand with President Donald Trump uh, every step of the way if I'm elected to Congress. Because, I mean, they have tried to destroy this guy. And you talk about the rhetoric getting heated. heated. They've tried to kill him twice, two assassination attempts. Now, I don't see that rolling back the other way. They been, though. You're saying the Democrats have tried to kill him. Whoever it was. Um, but, you know. Be careful here. When you, careful. When, when you talk about rhetoric, they're calling him Hitler. They're literally, there's ads out right now um, making equivocation between him and Hitler. So, of course, it's going to activate people that have mental issues or what have you, and they're going to go out and try to stop Hitler, which is basically what has happened. And so the guy survived one assassination attempt. They thwarted uh, another one down there in Mar-a-Lago. So, I, I mean, I see it pretty amped up on the other side, uh, particularly during this election cycle in terms of Working across the aisle, I'd say there is, uh, there are some opportunities on that. Uh, you heard my opening statement specifically, I talked about tariffs. As you notice, the Biden administration did not roll back any of the tariffs that President Trump put in on China. Most of those stayed in place for the most part. I think everybody at this point sees that there has to be something. Something has to happen as it relates to tariffs and China and the dumping of things like cheap steel into the marketplace here, tin plate steel, which is what hurt us up there in Weirton, West Virginia, Cleveland Cliffs. I'm for free trade, but I'm for fair trade. And I think that's where most people are. And so I do think there's an opportunity for bipartisan work on that. Also, the trades and vocations, right? I think there's a lot of opportunity to work across the aisle in trying to do more things like the Jumpstart Savings Program that I started here in West Virginia. I think there's a lot of opportunity to work across the aisle to put more emphasis on the trades and vocations in this country. But that has to come with us also trying to unleash American energy because a lot of those jobs flow from that as well, whether they're pipeliners, pipe fitters, you name it. But I think there is a, poss a, a potential and an opportunity to be able to work on tariffs, trying to work on uh, trade schools, and trying to work on the blue-collar work that I think we used to have so much more of in this, uh, in this country that we have to bring back. And the last point I'll make on that is that no country was ever made great by consuming. 
we were made great by producing. So I think people do want to get back to that. That's why you saw that bipartisan CHIPS Act pass to be able to bring back the capacity and the ability for us to manufacture chips in this country, semiconductors and things like that. So it's not just over there in Taiwan. Now, and also look, if Democrats want to work with us on immigration, that's great. I doubt many of them are going to want to. Uh, there's a few of them that seem to have gotten the picture on it. Um, interestingly enough, Senator Fetterman. So that's great. If they see this as an existential threat, which it absolutely is uh, to our country, I think it's wonderful. And, you know, the idea, though, that immigration doesn't affect West Virginia is crazy. Every state is a border state now at this point in the country. We just had right here, well, not Berkeley, Jefferson County, a woman killed by an illegal immigrant and had her body set on fire. That happened in May. We also, here in Berkeley County, I think you all probably read this in the newspaper, we had a Mexican drug cartel that was arrested, and I think it was like 20-some-odd different individuals that were operating right here in Berkeley County. Fentanyl is coming over the southern border. Fentanyl is killing people in this country every day and killing people in this state all the time. That is uh, an issue that is specifically and directly related to immigration. And let's move on to John Gilstrap for question uh, number two here. I want to talk a little bit about <coughs> climate change and controlling climate. Can, can I climate? respond to a couple things there? Or? Um, I'll tell you what, Steve. Let's move on to the next question. Okay. If you want to work some of that into another answer, sure. uh, but uh, we do want to get to a few things here. All right. Because um, I, 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 I think you guys have widely divergent ideas about about climate change in your opening statement you talked uh, riley you talked about um i forget that this is radio so riley you, you talked about it's also uh, tv preserving also the TV. the um uh the fossil fuels industry and i know that steve you feel differently about that that we need to wean ourselves away from that so first of all let's talk about the reality whether it is a reality in terms of, of climate change we're tomorrow we're going to reach near record high hot temperatures here in in berkeley county so is climate change an issue, and how do we address it? And Steve, have you go first. All right. And uh, before you go, we have a hard break at 9.31, so I'll give you three minutes apiece on these. Okay, thank you. So first off, before we address climate change, I do need to address some, some things that were brought up there. Um, you know, violent crime is violent crime. We also have children dying here in West Virginia, and West Virginian children's dying, and they're dying because of my opponent's policies with homeschooling, all right? Um, Riley, Browning, Kennedy, Miller, all right, homeschooled. There's no guardrails on that. And my opponent absolutely is a champion of the Hope Scholarship Program, which is not a scholarship. It's a voucher program, and there's virtually no guardrails on that. So before we start talking about immigrants coming across the border and using the fear-mongering that we use, Okay, to it's scare not, people. It's not a voucher program, to, just to be clear. Do you know what a voucher program is? Uh, yeah, it's called then, a Hope Scholarship. It's not a voucher program. <laughs> Riley, hang on. I, you, you after yeah, just I, three I, minutes, I, I, I run the program. It's not a voucher program. Anyway, so before we start using that fear mongering of the immigrants coming to come murder us in our beds, I just wanted to clarify that we have other problems here in West Virginia. Now, as far as global warming goes, yeah, it's a fact. And. Um, one of the things was we need to properly study this. Right now, the funding is in jeopardy to study this and how to um, how do we correct this or is it too late? One of the most intricate uh, or one of the most fundamental things to studying it is something, Admiral, that you used to be a big part of is NOAA. All right. Under Project 2025, 20, all right, they want to defund NOAA and the National Weather System. And so I'd like to know whether my opponent fully supports Project 2025 by the Heritage Foundation of defunding programs like that. So we need to study the problem. And yes, we need to be energy independent. But right now we are producing more oil than any other country in this world. All right. And we do export quite a bit. We do import and we can get there. But we need to look to the new technologies because this is not sustainable. And oh, by the way, the left didn't kill the oil, the coal industry in West Virginia. It was killed by the it was killed by the oil industry, who can simply pull energy out of the ground cheaper. All right, it's all about economics. It's not about 
woke politics, politics or anything of that nature. So with that, there's my answer, John. Riley Moore. So I know you didn't live in West Virginia during the clean power plant rule um, under Obama. You know, we lost 30,000 jobs directly within four years related to the clean power plant rule. You know that, right? I'll have to take your word for it. And, uh, <laughs> it's just and, uh, you're some of your it, facts I question already. So okay, I'll have to look yeah. that one up. So two, um, no, I, I'm I haven't killed anybody with the Hope Scholarship. I'm not saying you did. Um, three, it's not a voucher program. It's not a voucher program. It's a school choice program. Vouchers run completely different than what this is. This is an educational savings account. It's not a voucher program. And four, for us to kind of eschew people being killed in this county by an illegal immigrant, that happened. That's a real thing. That's not fear-mongering. That is something that actually happened just this year in May. And this woman was lit on fire. It's terrible. And, you know, that drug cartel, uh, the arm of it that was arrested here in Berkeley County, I, I mean, that never used to exist. It's terrible. And to your question, uh, John, what I would say is, look, we got to look at this two ways. Are you in favor of human flourishing? Or are you in favor of diminishing human impact on the globe? I am for human flourishing. And the great thing about fossil fuels, we have literally mastered the climate with fossil fuels, air conditioning, heating, things like that. Less, there's been less people died from any climate related incident in modern history than the last 500 years. We've been able to master the climate through that. I mean, air conditioning and hospitals and things like that, it's all powered by fossil fuels. If we wanna see this country grow, we wanna see this country thrive, Fossil fuels are the way we're going to do that. And look, the largest coal mining county as it relates to thermal coal is in this district. It's in this district. I'll let you take a guess at which one it is. Uh, if uh, anybody wants to guess, Steve, you can guess if you want. Well, Arch Coal, all right. And no, the, the and county, Barber. the county. Well, yeah, the, the county is Taylor County now, and Barber County. Er, Marshall. Marshall County has the largest underground mine in North America. That's and, funny because they're not the largest employer in that county. Uh, so they produce more thermal coal than any county actually in the entire state of West Virginia and provide a massive amount of severance taxes for um, our tax base here in West Virginia. You want to know why we have surpluses? That has to do with natural gas and coal severance tax, which literally added up to about a billion dollars in the last fiscal year. And that is how we have had these surpluses because, look, in coal and natural gas, obviously those prices rise and fall and all that, but we want to be able to have a, a, uh, an ability to continue to do this. That that mine up there that's run by uh, North American Consolidated in Moundsville, West Virginia, which is actually where my family is from, employs over a thousand people. It's a good but paying job. I do have a question. How much did Consolidated, by the way, contribute to your campaign finance? Oh, I don't know. I don't remember off the top of my head, but they've been supporting me in every race I've ever run in. Yep. And uh, I'm proud to be uh, supported by the coal industry. They, they employ a lot of people and those folks in Marshall County, West Virginia, which is in this district, their UMWA, uh, which I'm endorsed by the UMWA, by the way. Thank you for that endorsement. I have to get to my break in a second here, Riley. Wrap it up. Yep. And uh, they're making over $90,000 a year, those coal miners. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. We have to stop here. We'll be back with more with Steve Wendelin and Riley Moore in the second congressional district uh, running uh, against each other. Uh, Rob here in studio with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, uh, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, and our guests from the 2nd Congressional District, uh, the uh, Democrat Steve Wendelin and the Republican uh, Treasurer Riley Moore, of course, the Treasurer of the State of West Virginia, as we continue along uh, with some questions. And we thank the both of you for making this joint appearance on the program. Uh, just about 24 minutes left, so I would encourage you to try to keep your answers as brief as possible so we can get through a few more things. And the first question I'll throw out here to start this second part of our uh, uh, debate with you folks 
is the national debt. Uh, we are at, uh, as some say, $36 trillion. The interest alone from the national debt now exceeds the Defense Department's budget, which is uh, putting our nation in jeopardy in several different ways. Uh, you're one congressman of many. There's only so much power you have. I'll start with you, Steve Wendelin. How would you address the problem with the nation's debt? Well, one of the things is I do like to say is I am a fiscal conservative. Uh, none of us can run our households uh, without balancing the books and having to make those hard decisions. Now, a lot of those decisions are already made for us because we don't have a whole lot of discretionary spending. But where we do have those decisions, um, we need to be much better about how we manage it. What 39 years in the, in the U.S. Navy has shown me is how the federal budget cycle is supposed to work. And quite frankly, there is just a ton of waste in the federal government. And we need to go after that. One of the, the raw, bad bills of sale that we got sold is this idea that contractors can do things cheaper than the government can. And so we outsource a lot of inherently government functions. Within the DOD, there's so much waste. If we could eliminate the waste, um, we would still have the strongest military in the world, capable of fighting multiple adversaries at the same time. And we would have money to put into other programs like EPA, U.S. Department of Education, Health and, uh, Health and Human Services, which, by the way, I look at as part of our defense. But Steve, if, if, you, if you save money in one department but just simply redirect that money to another, you're not really helping the nation's debt. So the other thing we need to do is the tax code has to desperately be reformed. Every time we pass legislation, we layer over and over and over again. And that's what forms the, the loopholes. Some are by design, some are by accident. And we need to clean up the, the tax laws. It's that simple. Um, back in the day, and you and I have spoken about this before, you know, the highest income brackets were, what, at 90%? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we bring that back, but you know what? The ultra rich need to pay their fair share. Right now, there's so much tax avoidance going on by people being paid in stock options or being able to leverage those um, unrealized capital gains. I'm not talking about for you and me. I'm talk not talking about for anybody in this room that has a 401k. I'm talking about people that have hundreds of millions of dollars. And we need to clean that up. So bring in the revenue like that. And then we also need to clean up the waste. Riley Moore. Well, you know, I um, certainly would agree with the first part there of what Steve said. It is a huge and massive problem, the national debt. Now, one of the things I th think that we need to do, and the House has tried to do this, but it has to happen. We have to get back to regular order in Congress. All 12 of these appropriations bills need to be considered on the floor and passed. The problem that we have, we're always we're battling over the discretionary spending, which is a small part, I mean, it's sizable, but it's not the majority part of the budget. And it's really in that mandatory spending where you have a large chunk of this going on. But government, um, as Steve said correctly, there is a lot of waste and also raised an interesting point as it relates to contractors in the military. I think, and I can't remember the exact statistic, but it's something for every men or uh, man or woman in uniform there's like five or eight contractors <laughs> represented um in in the it, it's a lot it, is it is, i don't know what the exact number is but yeah, yeah okay it, hey look at that we found something yeah. we can agree on but it, it it is it is a lot and so it's the idea that oh we're saving money it is contracting contracting and it keeps going out and going out um but yeah i mean that that mandatory spending number is something that we're going to have to deal with. Now, that's kind of the tough stuff, right? Then you're talking Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, things like that. But something does have to happen around that mandatory spending number. But first and foremost, we have to get back to regular order. What that does, instead of going in these omnibus bills, big top line number, pass it or the government shuts down, we got to go through and pass each one of these bills that funds each department separately and so then people can have the ability to cut where they want to cut save where they want to save instead of getting this massive onerous bill that 
you can't really even touch. It's like take it or leave it. Um, so that's going to be one of the big parts of that. All right. Thank you, Robbie. Absolutely. Absolutely. Would you support uh, maybe even stopping congressional salaries when the budget doesn't get passed? Yeah, I don't – fine. Okay. You know, I mean, it, it's – you know, but I think you should just – you know, I, I'm not against government shutdowns at all because I think people have gotten to a point where it's just gotten so out of control. You hit on it. The interest itself is larger than the budget for the Defense Department. Can I just yeah, clar- go ahead, John. <clears throat> clarify a point on this? Are you suggesting that the government get into the manufacturing business, building factories to manufacture bombs and rockets and airplanes and such that the contractors are now doing? No, absolutely not. I'm I'm talking about mostly in the services. So right now, the United States Army cannot feed itself. We rely on contractors to feed the Army. So are they going to have their own farms and their own? No. We're taking it too far to an extreme. I'm talking about inherently government services. So having Army soldiers cook for the Army. I'm talking about having okay. uh, sailors paint the ships. I'm talking about us taking guarding our own gates. Right now, if you go to Fort Belvoir in Virginia, all right, we have contractors at the gates when we have full companies of military police garrisoned on Fort Belvoir. It's ridiculous. Those contractors are not cheaper than soldiers. And this was a bad bill of goods that was sold during the Cheney Rumsfeld era. Because they said, well, you know, it's cheaper for a contractor. No, it's not. It's just better for their bottom lines. Yeah, I'll chime in just real quick on that. There, there's, you know, certainly there are some aspects and things of cost savings to contracting some of this out. But to Steve's point, the CNO recently, Chief of Naval Operations, talked about this, you know, like building naval vessels. All of the engineering know how has been kind of sucked out of the Navy. You would know this better than I do sucked out of the Navy where the contractors are really kind of, instead of doing build to print, the contractors are in the driver's seat on this when we need that kind of know-how and those individuals to know how to do these things. Like when Steve's talking about, you know, painting ships and things of that nature, underwater welders and submarines and things like that. A lot of that stuff is contracted out. I mean, we do need to have that that know-how and that capability to be able to do that. And it is arguable how much the cost, because once you're kind of captured in that, a contractor can keep raising the prices on some of these goods and things that are being done for the United States military where, and I, I, I can't remember who it was, but they're holding up a, um, some member of Congress is holding up a bag of bolts and saying this bag of bolts right here costs $30,000 to be purchased by the Department of Defense. Uh, yeah, that that's a problem. It, it is a problem. And some of that's defense acquisition reform that certainly needs to happen and things like that. Right. Right now, this, the none of the services have successfully audited themselves. The Marine Corps came closest but they have not been able to do it. Would you keep giving money to somebody who can't tell you where it's being spent? All right, so, and that's where Congress comes in. But as long as we have all these sideshows and all this political theater going on, we can't do the people's business, and that's the people's business. So when we get into all the culture wars and all the woke stuff, which people just are quite frankly doing it for grandstanding, because they think that that's the low hanging fruit that's gonna get them elected instead of getting back to the people's business. Bill? Yeah, an issue that's going to hinge a great deal upon the outcome of the election is Ukraine. What is your view of the funding, continuing funding for Ukraine? Who are you going to first, Bill? I'll go with Raleigh first. Yeah, you know, I, I think that President Trump put this really well, and that is that we have to stop the killing, right? It has to stop some type of solution must be reached uh, some peaceable solution in between the Russians and the Ukrainians. So I don't think that uh, the American people want to see us funding a forever war or for however long in Ukraine without any uh, end in sight. I think people want to see some type of peaceable solution. Now, it has been put forward by some folks in the media and some others that there was a peace deal on the table that was scuttled at one point, uh, I think by Boris Johnson and some others in the Biden administration, but it has to end. This has to end. And I think Donald Trump is somebody who is going to be in a position to be able to end that war. We don't want to see it continue in perpetuity and continue 
not only for us to fund it, but for all these people over there, all these innocent lives lost for it con- to continue in the manner that it has. So I think what we need to do is put more resources towards finding a peaceable solution and ending this conflict. Steve? So no one knows how bad war can be till they've been in it, all right? No one in the military ever wants war. Here's the deal. What the president, what the former president has alluded to is, yeah, a peace agreement. No, the peace agreement is when Ukraine's borders are completely restored, to include Crimea, all right? This has been an illegal war prosecuted by a dictator, and we need to keep supporting Ukraine until they are pushed out of Russia. By the way, as far as the I'm funding, sorry, they, they're put, Russia pushed out of Ukraine. Yeah, Russia. Said, put, oh, I'm sorry. Until Russia is put out of Ukraine. Thank yeah, you very okay. much. A little dyslexic, dyslexic this morning here. So here's the other thing too. A lot of people think that we're just stroking them a check and handing them cash. No, that's not what we're doing. We give them actually our munitions, and then we then contract and buy new munitions. In some cases, some of this stuff is going to expire anyway. So the air defense systems and the rockets and the bullets and then everything else, all right, it comes out of our inventories, and then we repay American companies to replenish those stocks. So as gross as it sounds, it's good for the American economy to do this. But the fact that we're not just stroking them a check. But I will tell you, Putin will not stop. And, and I'm sorry, a piece where Russia permanently annexes parts of Ukraine is not acceptable. And if Ukraine doesn't stop him, where is he going to stop? Because the next stop is going to be NATO, a NATO country. And we've already heard the former president, all right, kick NATO in the teeth repeatedly, which is the strongest military uh, alliance in the history of our world. John Gilstrap. <clears throat> then why not do it? Why not seal the deal? Um, we, the United States has been dribbling munitions to Ukraine and sort of a little bit at a time. Why not give them the field artillery they really are asking for? Why not give them the fighters they want? Why not? I mean, if we're going to go to war, if we're going to have a proxy war with Russia, why not have a proxy war and close the deal? And in the fact, in, in effect, save Ukrainian lives at the risk, perhaps, of more Russian lives. Because we had a divided Congress over this that turned it into political football. That was not an administration administration decision. No, it, it was funding. Funding was being held up. Funding got held up by the former president back during his election. All right, he was trying to withhold aid that had already been given by Congress because he was trying to extort, all right, President Zelensky. Ukraine was invaded. In, I, I'm confused. Okay. So when the president was running against President Biden, when President Trump was running against President Biden, he was withholding aid that we had already promised okay to the ukrainians the congress had already put aside when we knew that there was this buildup on their borders all right so it keeps being used as a political football okay riley yeah what i would say is interesting of note is that the russians didn't take any land in ukraine when President Trump was president. Uh, in 2014, when they invaded Crimea, that's when Biden was president. Um, or, uh, pardon me, Obama was president. Biden was vice president. And then when Biden was president is when they decided to invade Ukraine. And, you know, it, it demonstrates that we need strong leadership in the White House to be able to keep peace. Now, Nobody, including myself, wants to see Russia invade uh, any territory of NATO. That obviously triggers triggers an Article 5. That's uh, a response from us and our allies within NATO. Um, I'd say what's interesting of note um, throughout this conflict that we've been funding, I mean, 
we do have to keep in context that th this is a nuclear armed nation. I, I mean, how far are we going to be willing to push this with, as you know, rightly stated, this dictator over there with Vladimir Putin, where he might, you know, lob some tactical nuke or something like that. I mean, if we box him in, how does this end, right? I, and that's what I get concerned about. That's what I am worried about. And that's why I'd like to see a peace settlement in this. I want to ask you guys a question about the Trump tax cuts. There seems to be no appetite in Washington, D.C. for spending cuts. So if you're in Congress and let's say uh, Donald Trump is reelected and we need to extend or kill the Trump tax cuts, how do you vote on that, Steve Wendelin, if you're elected? I vote to kill them. Um, you know, trickle down economics doesn't work. It didn't work with Reagan and it doesn't work now. So giving tax cuts to the most wealthy in this country simply doesn't work. If we're going to give tax cuts, they need to be aimed specifically at the middle and working class. Riley. Yeah, I think that's where those tax cuts were aimed. There were a lot of people in the middle class that saw a lot of, uh, that saw reduction in their income tax here in the country. And, you know, getting rid of that salt uh, um, write off in some of these other states, I think was the right thing to do where they're able to write off some of their state taxes on their federal taxes and things like that because they live in high tax states. Well, maybe perhaps cut your taxes in the states that you live in. Pay your own taxes in the state that you're in. So, yeah, you did see some of these more high um, uh, earning individuals ended up paying more taxes in places like California and New York and some of the other um, uh, places around the country, which I think has been a good thing. I mean, the Trump tax cuts spurred some of the greatest economic growth that I've seen in my lifetime, and I would certainly vote to extend them. You guys have, uh, at the moment, I'm doing the math in my head here, about a minute and a half apiece to uh, close this out here. Steve, you get to go first. So first off, I just want to let everyone out there know that when you elect me, I'm going to be representing the entire district and the interests of all of West Virginia. I'm not going to pander to a base. I'm not going to pander to supporters. Okay. And I will listen to all of you and represent your desires to Congress. Um, one of the things that, that is really important is reaching out and being able to talk to the constituency. And so that is one of the things I will absolutely guarantee with you that if you as a constituent write my office, phone call my office, email my office, you will get a response and we will try and help you out the best we can because we are your voice at the federal level. And I pledge that I've led for years and that's how I'm going to practice being your congressman is by leading. I will show leadership in Congress and I will help lead this state. Not anymore. Thank you. Well, first I want to thank uh, you, Rob and WRNR for putting this on and thank you for Steve for being here and everybody who's participated in this. I think this is a really wonderful uh, part of our democracy to be able to kind of get our ideas out and talk about them on programs like this. So look, if elected, um, Here's what I would say. If you are happy with the results that I have provided as state treasurer, also as a state legislator in the House of Delegates, vote for me. And there has been a lot of success, and I'm going to continue to build on that success that we have had here, pushing back against ESG, pushing back against DEI, pushing back against a lot of this woke activity that is happening out here that is literally eroding the culture of our country. If you want a congressman who's going to support shutting down the border, vote for me. And look, I'm a sixth generation West Virginian. I love this state. My children are born and raised here, and I'm going to be here for the rest of my life. And it is my goal and my life's dream to continue to fight to have a West Virginia that is worthy of our dreams and our children's future. And I hope you all vote for me here in November. Thanks so much. God bless. From uh, our perspective, I want to thank the both of you for making this uh, joint appearance here on the program because 
when you do that, democracy wins. Uh, the voters win. Uh, I, I think it's always a mistake when candidates don't get together at the same time and answer questions so that the voters have an actual idea of how to compare the thoughts that candidates have. So thank you both for doing that. That's much appreciated here. Uh, Steve, excuse will you, me. And they yes, did it in a very civil manner, which I appreciate very much. Have different views. They're passionate about their views, but they were civil at all times. I just wish it would have been a lot sooner, but it's a once early voting started. Well, we do what we can. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, what were you about to say? I was about to say we are going to take our last minute break here. We'll be right back with more, and I'll, I'll get to you during the commercial break with the rest of that. I don't have time for the answer now, though, but uh, final minute next.